we're focused today uh, uh, with focus on asthma care providers and home visiting programs. And uh, what the session is about is integrating community health worker services into pediatric asthma care. We're very happy to be meeting today at Beautiful Wilder Center. We hope you found us okay. And we're looking forward to a wonderful morning of learning and exchange. And then a couple words about our program. Our program is part of a larger initiative called uh, Success with CHWs. Um, it's funded by the St. Paul Foundation and Minnesota Community Measurement. And we'll get a little bit more into uh, success with CHWs later after the break. Um, but our learning objectives uh, for today are to increase familiarity with the CHW role and its benefits to patients, to families, communities, and the healthcare system, to share ways to integrate CHWs with members of your asthma team and to effectively address asthma disparities, and to explore questions around uh, CHW scope of practice, education, financing, and supervision. So, and then a few words about our alliance uh, before we get into the program at hand. Our alliance is a partnership that has been around for about a decade. Um, a few years ago, we incorporated as a nonprofit in Minnesota. We have a voluntary board, and we build community and systems capacity for better health through the integration of community health worker services. So we have a unique mission in our state. This program is prompted over concern, concern I know that you share around asthma disparities in St. Paul, in the Twin Cities, and in our state, and the opportunities we have to really add to our toolkit and to begin to introduce effective CHW strategies to the care models uh, here uh, to get better outcomes. And we know that asthma is, 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 can be uh, prevented in many cases. It can be better managed. We also know it's highly serious. In, in talking with um, uh, Debbie Givo, uh before the, the session started, she mentioned that two students in her school district died in the last, uh, the last five, six years from uh, preventable asthma. So uh, there are serious asthma disparities, and there's a lot we can do better. So um, with that, uh, with that focus on equitable and optimal outcomes for all communities, that's what we're about, I'd like to introduce our, our guest presenters, our faculty for this morning. I'm so delighted that we have uh, Dr. Megan Sandal and Ann Walton from Boston Medical Center joining us. Um, a few words about each. Uh, Megan is a physician uh, with a, a Master's of Public Health. She's a pediatrician at Boston University uh, Schools of Medicine and Public Health. And she's also medical director of the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership and co-principal investigator of the Children's Health Watch. Um, she has expertise as a clinician, as a researcher, and especially as a leader, uh, nationally recognized expert on housing and child health. Um, she has written numerous peer-reviewed scientific articles and papers on how housing affects child health. She's also served as principal investigator for numerous NIH, HUD, and foundation grants, working with the Public Health, uh, Boston Public Health Commission and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health to improve the health of vulnerable children, especially those with asthma. Uh, joining Megan is Ann Walton. Anne is an RN and a certified asthma educator. She's the asthma care coordinator and research nurse at Boston Medical Center, where she's been involved in asthma research and programming since 2009. Her work has focused on community health worker asthma home visiting programs and asthma education in community-based health centers and primary care. In that capacity, she's developed a comprehensive asthma training program for CHWs and a CHW supervisor training program. She has a background in critical care nursing and health education. And uh, prior to her work at Boston Medical Center, she coordinated educational programs for parents of children with asthma and allergies for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation New England chapter. So please join me in welcoming Megan and Anne.
when we think about kind of the program objectives kind of overall for this morning, um, we're hoping that we'll increase your familiarity with the community health worker role, really their function and the results and value that they can have, particularly in the era of healthcare reform. And we're going to specifically focus on asthma. We could have this discussion about diabetes, cardiovascular, and others, but we're really going to focus on asthma today. Um, I think we're going to learn about a bunch of different models. We're going to describe the model that we're implementing at Boston Medical Center, but we're also going to be uh, discussing other models, um, both from public health departments, from uh, um, more uh, home health agencies and other things that have been done across the country. Uh, and then I think that we're really going to explore the question of related to outcomes, teamwork, the training and the supervision and the integration, and then finally try and address a little bit about funding. So those are kind of our, our three goals. You can see how well we meet them by the end. Please interrupt with questions. This is meant to be interactive. We're not here to talk at you. We're here to talk with you. Um, so with that, I'm going to take a little bit of an audience survey. I want to get a sense of who's in the room. So what are the different roles that people play in the, the audience? All right. Asthma specialist. Asthma specialist. Great. Community health worker. Community health worker. Great. Program manager. Community Another community health worker. Great. Public School nurse. Public health department. I heard. Yeah. Asthma care coordinator. Asthma care coordinator. All right. So we've got um, asthma specialists, some community health workers, program managers, uh, school nurse, public health department, asthma care coordinators. Uh, nursing students, health plan based people, and then home agency based people, American Lung Association, ER physician. Nurse, nurse thank you. ER, ER nurse, but good too. That's awesome. All right, so um, this is great. This is a really, um, a really nice audience mix, and I think that um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to tailor our discussion so that it's going to be useful for all your different levels. Um, uh, I'm going to start first with kind of, in some ways, why we're here. I live in Massachusetts and have uh, practiced there, and I think the burden of asthma in Massachusetts is, is pretty significant. I think it also is pretty significant in Minnesota, and this idea of kind of the, um, the rising levels of asthma, um, the, the most recent kind of comprehensive survey we have is from a few years ago where one in ten people in Massachusetts, about uh, close to 10 percent of adults and about um, more than 10 percent of children have asthma, and then the hard thing here is that when we look at the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, or BRFSS as some people call it, B-R-F-S-S, they will look at who would be classified as not well controlled or who would be classified as very poorly controlled. And when you collapse those two categories together, like 75 percent of adults are either not well controlled or poorly controlled, 65 percent of children are, would classify into that. So we know that not only do we have increasing rates of asthma, but we have increasing uncontrolled asthma and that we're not moving that dial enough, right? And so, and I think that what's really clear is when we start thinking about those gaps of care, we know that those numbers are even worse among black and Hispanics in our state. And when we think about that, that's a consistently high rate of hospitalization. So not just not well controlled asthma, but ending up in the emergency room in the in the hospital. And so really trying to think about what, what's the way to really try and address that. And so when the Massachusetts Department of Public Health founded its asthma office in 2009, one of its main goals was actually to use community health workers as a way to address disparities. And you'll hear Ann and I talk about the READY study, which is R-E-A-D-Y, right? It's reducing ethnic and racial asthma disparities in youth. We really wanted to focus on young kids. Um, we do, uh, started at first at 2 to 11 at trying to reduce those uh, asthma disparities through a community health worker model. Um, so I'm going to start with what is a community health worker. And I actually want to hear what people's um, impression, we have a couple of community health workers in the audience. Um, uh, what is a community health worker? Or who is a community health worker? What, would you, what are the key things you would describe? Someone who actually is from the community, absolutely. As I was going to say, so, so not only from the community, but perhaps having like cultural and linguistic 
kind of um, uh, competence, right? Because they're from the community that they may be able to, to, to have that knowledge. It is really interesting. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history of community health workers, right? And so in some ways, um, uh, we'll talk both about the designation, so the professional designation, which has really now been recognized um, by the, the Bureau of Labor as a thing, as an actual um, kind of professional designation, but then also thinking about historically, people have been community health workers probably for centuries, right, in terms of it and being able to acknowledge that. Absolutely. I think that um, one of the key things uh, that that I, sometimes people will talk about is community health workers and, and their training. And so with that, I'm gonna actually have Anne turn over, talk a little bit about the history of community health workers and see if we can kind of um, bolster that definition. So as Megan said, the, the role of community health worker actually dates back to the 17th century where people were um, chosen from the community and it was a position in society that was well respected. Um, it was generally the go-to person who had information about health care, had ideas about what to do, where to go for help, um, and helped people to understand how to access the resources. So it's not very much different than what it is today. Um, the American Public Health Association, I'm not sure when this happened, Megan might know, but um, has a clear definition of what a community health worker is. And they say that it's a trusted member of or deeply understands the community served. Um, they act as a liaison between health and social services and the community. They work to build individual and community capacity by doing outreach, by doing community education. Um, sometimes they do some informal counseling. They understand social support networks and how to access those. And they work as advocates, but they also work to help people self-advocate. And that's really important. Um, so what's really distinctive about a community health worker? I, I hear often, what do I need a community health worker for? You know, why do we need one more person on the team? Um, what can they possibly add? Um, I think it's important to recognize that the role of the community health worker is a very distinctive role. They generally are not providing clinical care. So I hear physicians and nurses say, well, what are they going to do? I'm the one that's prescribing. I'm the one, you know, I'm the doctor. I'm the nurse. And that's not what a community health worker does at all. Um, a community health worker primarily works at building a relationship, a trusting relationship first and foremost. And by doing that, they can relate to the community partially because they're of the community. They speak the language. They understand the, the health um, practices and the cultural, um, the cultural practices. And so once they've built that relationship, they can work to help us to reinforce what physicians order and what nurses teach. So they're really, I feel like they're that missing link. Um, they're, they understand the culture and are perhaps better able to recognize why there's that disconnect. Why do we give prescriptions? Why do we hand out spacers and then find out that the child's in the emergency room? You know, why are they not following our instructions at home? It, everything's good, I've covered this, I've covered that, I've covered the next thing, but yet something's not working. And so I really see them as that missing link. They generally um, do not hold a professional license. Um, that sort of defeats the purpose in some, in some ways. Um, you want them to be viewed as one of the group. Um, so there was some, a study done that looked at eight publications of community health workers, and it was published in the Journal of Asthma. Um, and the focus was low-income urban communities, and they were looking at how CHWs could improve asthma with re regard to envir the environment. And CHWs were really found to be very effective. Um, again, CHWs can be the eyes and ears of the physician and the, the healthcare team. They can see things in the home, and I'm sure the community health workers that are in the audience can verify this, that, that we're never gonna see, you know, unless we go into the home. And oftentimes those things that are in the home are the biggest barrier. It isn't always transportation or the things that we might think of not accessing, you know, insurance or, or funding for, for what they need. Sometimes it's the fact that asthma is the lowest rung on the, on the ladder in terms of their priority. And by having a community health worker go into the home and actually visualize what's going on, 
because they have that relationship with the family, they're, they're going to almost become a confidant. So they're going to hear things that we're never going to hear. Um, uh, we were at dinner last night, and one of the physicians at dinner said that um, she has trouble sometimes with her family's, you know, with full disclosure because her family, you know, she had a dad come into the office and he was embarrassed because he had recently gone through a divorce and he didn't know what was going on with the, the child's asthma. You know, people come to our offices and they have a certain amount of pride. They don't want to say they have, you know, ceilings falling in and water on the floor and, you know, roaches roaming, you know. So the community health worker is a really important piece, I think, of the asthma care team. Um, in Massachusetts, we have a comprehensive outreach education certificate program, which we're fortunate enough, as Megan mentioned, to ha it was funded through the Department of Public Health, and it was developed and implemented through the Boston Public Health Commission. Um, it's a comprehensive core program that offers seven separate trainings, and I think it's like eight days or nine days. It's pretty intense. Um, and people who are in, in these trainings learn about assessment skills. They learn how to, how to look and, and pull out the important information from a home visit, which isn't always, it doesn't always have to do with that, honestly. Um, they learn about public health and the importance of you know, living in communities where there was a level of wellness. Um, they learn some leadership skills, not to come in and bulldoze the family into doing what, you know, they think they should do, but rather how to gently guide a family to doing what we hope they'll do. Um, they learn about cross-cultural communications, um, the importance of taking what they learn in the home and translating that to their supervisor in the medical home in a way that isn't sort of, I said to do this and the patient won't do it, you know, so to bridge that gap between the cultures. Um, and they learn a lot about the whole process of outreach in the community, um, sort of the nuts and bolts of doing home visits. Um, the training emphasizes three specific skills, conducting educational ses sessions either in a community-based um, program uh, in various cultural groups and also individual settings, obviously the one-on-one -on -one with the home visit. Um, it emphasizes expanding proficiency to provide information and referrals on a range of health topics, so that I'll get into a little bit later the specifics of asthma training. So this, this training is really just the overall nuts and bolts core training. Um, and it prepares the CHW for getting, once they've got sort of the, the etiquette, I guess you might say, of community health work, then they go into the, the disease specific program. Um, and there's a huge emphasis on taking the health messages that come from physicians and nurses and sharing them and shaping them in a way that is going to um, be listened to. Um, we don't want our messages to fall on deaf ears, and part of that, it, part of that um, has to do with how we present the message. You know, for, for us in our program, I think that we really try to match up the culture of the family with the CHW. We have a large Hispanic um, and Latino population and Haitian Creole. So we have a community health worker who's Haitian and we have one who's actually Puerto Rican. Um, and so when they're going into the home, it's much different than if I were to go into the home. I think that I would get much more resistance and much more skepticism thrown in my direction than they do. And issues do come up. We had a family just recently who um, the husband had recently been, um, I was going to say exported, um, <laughs> deported um, to his uh, country of origin. And the mom was very concerned that they were looking for her too and they, if she gave too much information they were going to come out and get her. And the community health workers, because of the training, the extensive training that they get, they're really able to say, you know, I understand your concern, but while I'm here, perhaps, you know, we can, we can talk about that and I can look to, you know, getting you some reassurances, but let's talk about asthma. So they're, they, with motivational interviewing skills in various ways, they, they're trained to kind of, not say twist the conversation, but turn the conversation in the direct in, direction in which they want it to go. And that's why sometimes when we go in for asthma, asthma is not what we talk about. So, um, in Massachusetts as well, with the um, funding from the DPH and the support of both DPH and the Boston Public Health Commission, 
we've developed a supervisor training program as well. And the supervision training addresses quality assurance, communicates as three, and oh, there's actually four things, but it does address three, uh, quality assurance, communication and information, and um, creating a supportive environment. And in Massachusetts, community health worker supervisors are generally licensed practitioners. Um, they can be a, a master's in public health um, as well. But there's a big push to have supervision by a licensed person. One of the questions that, that has come up is, how do, how do I know that the community health workers are doing the right thing? Um, part of that is dependent on the quality of, tr of training that you have. And as a supervisor myself, I do observational visits. I meet with the community health workers once a week. I'm always, I only work two days a week, but my phone is always on. We text, we email. I pretty much know what their patient caseload is. And um, if there are any issues, they know to call me. Um, and so I'm also, I went through the training that the community health workers do for core training. Um, and I was, I participated in developing it. So, um, but I wanted to, to be there to see the way the community health workers responded to the training. Um, I think for supervisors to supervise well, it's important that they understand the role of the person they're supervising. Um, and so, in, in Massachusetts, the supervisors, um, through one of the programs that Megan is going to talk about a little bit later, it's a collaborative, they have come not only to the supervisor training, but they've come to the regular core training and the asthma training, so that the, tra they, the supervisors know what's going on. And that, I think that's, that's certainly for me, when I first heard of the community health worker model, I immediately kind of went, Another person trying to take my job. You know, I've been a nurse since 1976, and you know, I was told that, oh, if you didn't have this degree, you were out the door. If you didn't have that degree, you know, if you didn't do this or that or the next thing, and you know, I'm still here 30 some odd years later. Um, and so I quickly learned when I began to understand this model that that's not the case at all. Community health workers do something I cannot do. Um, I am not capable to build that relationship with the cultural sensitivity that is required. Um, in, in a home setting, doing visit, visits like they do. In Minnesota here, it's a little bit different, and Joan can step in if, if she'd like. But um, Minnesota, you have a standardized competency-based education, which is it's based in the um, higher <coughs> education, you know, what do I want to say, community, community colleges is what I want to say, 14 credit pr program. And it's classroom, it's field-based, it's a certificate program. There's a lot of on-the-job training, and we do that as well. We um, mentor the, the, old, the more experienced community health workers, work with the less experienced. Um, they observe each other. They go on their first visits together, so they see how each other works and communicates with the family. So there's a lot of on-the-job learning as well, and that's a big component of the Minnesota training. And continuing education, which hopefully is across the board. Um, supervision, de de um, varies depending on the, the area of practice, the setting. Um, community health workers who are working in a government agency, according to the statute, are required to be supervised by medical physicians, advanced practice nurses, dentists, which was really interesting for me because I've never heard of a community health worker in the role of, for dentist practice. And then someone, one of the community health workers that had dinner with us last night was saying, you know, a lot of her patients have dental caries. And um, so I could see that, that that would be definitely a beneficial use of community health workers. And I'm going to turn the show over to, to Joan to talk a little bit about the Minnesota Community Health Worker Alliance um, and how they work with their supervisors and provide resources. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Anne. <clears throat> um, I'll just add a few words here um, to give you a, a kind of a spotlight on our, our Minnesota CHW building blocks. And it's something I, I hope all of you in this room will take pride in because Minnesota is one of the recognized leaders in CHW field development, field um, uh, building. And so what does that mean? It means that uh, a group of folks very much representative of the kinds of people in this room got together a decade ago and uh, together with CHWs, uh, with health department representation and representation by nursing and health plans and um, community-based groups and, and a wide range of, of partners, including educators, first developed a scope of practice for CHWs <clears throat> that was based on an understanding of the CHW role that reflects three things. CHWs have a set of attributes. They have this shared 
life experience with the people they serve, which can be defined around ethnicity or race or health condition. Being a veteran, for example, would be a shared life experience. So again, this, this can cut across many different ways. And then, of course, training. So the, the training that was built on this scope of practice is competency-based. It's a statewide program, only one in the US to date. And it's offered in higher education. And uh, why would that be? Because we really wanted to make sure that what we built here in Minnesota would be an educational pathway for CHWs and not a dead end. So it's, the program is currently offered in a network of seven schools, uh, some community colleges. Uh, St. Kate's offers the program uh, here in St. Paul where it's standalone or part of a bachelor's degree program. Um, it's also offered by Summit Academy in North Minneapolis. It's offered in Rochester and in Bemidji and in Mankato. So we have some uh, 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 greater Minnesota um, uh, sites as well. It's available in, in a face-to-face -face format by and large, but um, our programs in Mankato and in Bemidji are either online or hybrid online in person. So, um, so so scope of practice, standardized education uh, uh, in, in post-secondary schools leading to a certificate. And then that certificate is recognized by our Minnesota Department of Human Services, that's our state Medicaid agency, for um, uh, specific CHW payment. Not the totality of the role in all its many places where it can be helpful, but um, in, um, in, in uh, uh, provider settings uh, and a wide variety where there's clinical supervision um, and those can include <clears throat> uh, clinics, dental offices, local public health, um, Indian Health Service, um, hospitals. Um, the visits can occur in an institutional setting they can occur in the home or they can uh, be carried out in the community. They can be one-to-one uh, 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 -one, or they can be group. And so there is actually a uh, Medicaid payment for that diagnostic related patient education. So there are other uh, functions that CHWs provide that are very, very important, um, but they're not uh, all covered. Um, but this significant patient education piece is. So uh, just as uh, Ann said, um, clinical supervision is very important. CHWs are parts of teams. Um, and uh, that assurance of training is in, and supervision is, is, really, is really critical. Um, the other thing I want to mention, and, and I'll get to that question in a second, is that we mm -hmm. offer through the Alliance a CHW Supervisors Roundtable. Uh, Bonnie Carlson from um, uh, St. Paul Ramsey uh, Health Department is here and is an active member of our group. And we meet in person or by phone every other month. It's a chance for CHW supervisors to grow in their role, become stronger supervisors. They're um, in a unique pos position because uh, the role is newer to a lot of mainstream provider organizations. So this is a great opportunity to share lessons, share uh, challenges. So uh, anyone here uh, would love to have you uh, uh, join the, uh, the Alliance. And, and uh, if you're interested, join the um, Supervisors Roundtable. Know that it's a resource for you uh, going forward. So two questions. Um, one is about the duration of the training. What does uh, 14 hours uh, relate to? And the training typically is accomplished across what would be a semester of work on a part-time evening school basis, or it can be accomplished at St. Kate's has offered it as a, as a program across a full academic year um, that meets two days a week across a whole year. So it's, it's intensive. It's foundational training. So it's, um, we call it the liberal arts of the CHW field. So you know, if you're a physician, you've had your medical school training, then you will specialize if you so choose. Um, if you're you know, in nursing, you have you know, your, your basic nursing training. And then likewise, if you're gonna go into critical care or go into public health, you'll have on top of that additional training. So this is generalist training. And keep in mind, we're a leader. So all around the United States, there are very few states that that, that um, have this uh, kind of, of, of training, um, and other states have been interested in, in our training and, and, and uh, 
folks from our uh, education committee have gone out to um, uh, visit with other organizations that want to learn outside of Minnesota uh, what we're doing. Now, the CHW role is a relational role, right? Face-to-face, um, uh, -face, uh, coming from the community. So online is not for everyone. We're, we're you know, first to say that. And so um, it's uh, the tension between wanting to provide CHW training, provide access to the CHW role in greater Minnesota, and I do remind our folks from New England, you can fit the entire state of Massachusetts in St. Louis County, okay? So, um, you, know, we're, you know, we have the, a lot of rural areas and, and we also have um, uh, diverse populations in communities all across our state. We have, uh, as you know, uh, Native American um, reservations, tribal, tribal um, uh, nations, uh, where there's the CHR role, it's a CHW type role, very eager for this training as well. So um, that's something we want to be really careful about. And uh, our, um, our faculty at the two schools that offer the online do, do talk to students about that. And, and the Bemidji program um, offers, as I said, also the, the hybrid, so there is some face-to-face -face as well. So I think it's, it's um, balancing that, that need with the importance of the, the relational role. Um, so I'm gonna step back and uh, uh, feel free uh, to visit with, with me at the break or afterwards if you wanna learn more about um, our Minnesota building blocks. I just want to speak to the issue of um, internet or online study. I have a son who has dyslexia and a learning disability, and he does his best learning online. Um, I'm an auditory and a visual learner, and so I like to be present and interact. And I think it's about balance. It's about understanding that people who train online do need to come and do some role playing with motivational interviewing and you know with hypothetical situations and work things out. I don't ever think it's an all or nothing kind of situation. So uh, transitioning more into this idea of like a professional designation, right? What do we, um, uh, what's been established? We talked about kind of the history of CHWs, kind of the specific roles, how do you train someone? So not anybody gets to put the words community health worker on their resume, right? This is something that, that someone should have some type of formalized training. And we're, I think it's really important to talk about the generalist training, right? And then specialized training in asthma, and then supervisor training for the community health workers. So there are a lot of different levels in terms of being able to say, not only are you, are you trained to do this work, but what type of training did you get? Um, so the Department of Labor actually recognized in 2009 that there's a distinct occupation code for community health workers. So they actually now track this across states. And they really kind of identified it in kind of four key areas. So it's like assisting individuals and communities to adopt healthy behaviors. So healthy behaviors is a huge kind of component, that motivational <laughs> interviewing, that discussions. Um, we did uh, additional training with our community health workers around smoking cessation, right? And thinking about ways in which they could be trained in that. Um, the second is really conducting outreach and implementing programs in the community that promote, maintain, or improve individual or community health. And so this is where um, we're going to describe in a minute the program uh, that we uh, kind of adapted from Seattle King County, which is a very rigorous kind of standardized program you have in our your folder a lot of our materials, right, where we have like a regimented visit one, you do this, visit two, you do that type of thing. Um, uh, the third is providing information on available resources, providing social support, informal counseling. So that's where, you know, a lot of times community health workers are really doing a lot more than just the, the education you're, you're asking them to do um, and really helping families connect to, to social resources, food, um, uh, energy assistance, things like that. And then identifying and advocating for individuals and communities. I think that we, uh, to hear our community health workers talk about how proud they are of people learning to problem solve on their own so that it's not that you continue to need the community health worker but that people think about it. We uh, talk a lot about the asthma action plan and the community health workers will take pictures on their phone of like the asthma action plan being up on the wall or being up on the fridge and things like that and being able to start to really utilize it. Um, uh, I want to stop for just a second and talk a little bit about 
uh, health care reform and opportunities. So the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act did actually acknowledge community health workers. Um, it actually called out that they were recognized as important members of the healthcare workforce, um, and then really acknowledged that there's a lot of evidence around how they improve health, access, outcomes, strengthening healthcare teams, enhancing quality, particularly for people in poor and underserved and diverse. And the summary of this is from a health affairs article in July 2010. Uh, I think that um, in Massachusetts, we're a little bit further ahead of healthcare reform because we started it a little bit earlier. And so um, I'm going to uh, just take a minute uh, to talk a little bit about two opportunities that we're currently ex exploring, actually three, that we're exploring around uh, long-term funding sustainability. So uh, the first is what's called a bundled payment. Um, how many people have heard of word bundled payment? All right, so a couple. So this is the idea that um, instead of being in a fee-for-service world, right? So if you come to the doctor, you send a bill to the insurance company and they send back a fee, right? Um, that we're going more into, you have patients who are registered in your practice and you get a payment each <laughs> month to basically manage their care. Um, honestly, it's really capitation, you know, just called something different. And the idea is that you bundle with that payment an additional fee for asthmatics. So you get an additional amount of money each month to manage your asthmatics. And so um, part of the ability of Massachusetts to do healthcare reform earlier is we got a Medicaid waiver. So we got a waiver from the federal government to actually um, uh, do innovative practice to try and get everyone insured. And written into our Medicaid waiver was this Massachusetts bundled payment for pediatric asthma. There's actually, it's a two page document, one of the pages describes this um, bundled payment. And uh, my understanding is it got a lot of scrutiny um, uh, from the federal government, but it did, it did get passed. And so the idea was, was that, say, a primary care practice would manage their asthmatics with this fee and understood as part of that was that their high-risk asthmatics would have a home visiting program with community health workers. So it's not meant just to fund the home visiting. It's meant to fund general quality improvement within the practice and then have within that. Um, uh, and so four practices are starting this pediatric bundled payment pilot. Um, uh, there are two of them within Children's Hospital Boston, the actual hospital itself, and then one of the community health centers in Boston, Martha Elliott, that the hospital runs, um, Tufts Medical Center, and uh, Lowell Community Health Center are the four sites that are gonna be piloting this. Um, the second area of funding um, is, is that Massachusetts uh, passed its original um, uh, healthcare reform legislation in 2006 and then passed an updated version in 2010. And one, during the update, they actually wrote in something called the Prevention Wellness Trust Fund. This is basically a tax on hospitals that they pay money into this trust fund to do prevention. And it's interesting, the legislature was really focused on prevention for things that would pay off quickly. They required that there would be a return on investment for prevention, which any of you in the public health world know is, is hard. And so the bar of what got to be included as prevention, um, they chose four topic areas. So one was tobacco cessation, which has been shown to pay off. Um, the second is preventing elderly falls, which has also been shown to pay off. The third is cardiovascular disease. And the fourth was pediatric asthma. And so that in that, communities could bid that they were going to be part of the Prevention Wellness Trust implementation. They had to choose two of the four areas at a minimum. And so six of the communities actually chose pediatric asthma as part of their um, uh, pilot. And again, includes both the idea of quality improvement within the clinical practice and included asthma home visiting with community health workers. And so we're actually kicking off a learning collaborative next month between the six cities that are going to be doing this plus the four bundled payment pilot sites to kind of create kind of the, the platform for understanding the implementation, the funding streams and others. And, and uh, Pam made a good point that we need to make sure when we're costing it out, it's not just for the community health worker salary, it's for the supervision time, it's for the administrative time and other things.
Yeah. So it's really, it, so the question was, um, I'm repeating it for the camera, was, the, was around the idea of, um, isn't this really what public health nurses used to do? And I think there's no doubt that in some ways I'll say that we're somewhat, I don't want to say reinventing the wheel, but we're redesigning the system to deliver something that traditionally was there. I think that um, uh, the reality is, is that you don't have enough public health nurses, right? I mean, that's, the, that's my understanding, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but but the idea is thinking through ways in which to design a system that you could utilize the public health nurse and use a community health worker as one of the extenders for thinking through it and, and really complementing the public health nursing. So it's not replacing. So let's be honest, we're not talking about public health funding here. We're talking about health care funding, right? We're talking about the, the, um, the idea of using a health care dollar to do what is essentially a public health mission. And that when we think about the disparity of funding, right, in this United States, we spend $8,000 per person and we get really bad outcomes, right? Like we are, you know, in 34 industrialized countries, we're like 26th, right? We spend three times as much as everyone else and we get literally among the worst outcomes. And part of it is because we have not had healthcare embrace its public health mission. We have not thought about ways to deliver public health interventions through a healthcare dollar. And so in many ways when we're thinking about this, and I'm going to transition a bit to talking about the evidence, right, because for a healthcare dollar to want to be spending it, they have to think about it the same way they think about pharmaceuticals and other things. And so we're going to talk about, about that. But I will also talk about some of the models. There's not a one way to deliver this, right? So we're going to describe how we do it at um, Boston Medical Center, which is um, where Anne is the supervisor. She predominantly stays in the office. She does limited supervision in the fact that she, from a quality assurance point of view, she goes on 5 to 10% of the home visits to make sure that the community health worker is doing. But she's not there all the time, so I want to be clear about that. I'll talk about a, another model called HARP, where it's a three-visit model where the first visit is done with the public health nurse and the community health worker together, and then the community health worker does the follow-up. And so that's another way to, to try and think about it. The third way that in Massachusetts we're exploring long-term sustainability is through a case rate. So this is an idea that it's still the fever service world exists, right? So just like when you get a surgery, you get a case rate. You get an amount of money, a lump sum, and you deliver a service within that lump sum. And so we are currently trying to negotiate within um, some of, particularly the Medicaid managed care plans, a case rate for delivering the service for us, the four visits, home visits with the environmental goods and other things. Um, I think that it's, um, it's another way to try and fund it. I think the population base, the bundled payment is where the future is going. So I'm not convinced we'll need a case rate forever, but it may be until those are reality funding streams, we're gonna kind of negotiate both sides. And I do think that um, there's, there's very different models coming down the pike around global payments, right? So it's everything and you have to live within that budget versus more of these risk contracts, right? Where you get an amount of money and you um, are hoping that someone doesn't come to the hospital, but the pharmacy side of things is very different. I will say, just as an aside, is that, that um, pharmacy is something that I always find fascinating, right? Because we don't blink at the $1,000 pill, right? We, we don't. Hepatitis C is a, the latest example where you know, they are literally paying you know, millions of dollars monthly for a $1,000 pill, right? And so what I think is important, and we're going to talk about the evidence, is, is that oftentimes the sticker shock around what it costs to do four asthma community health worker visits with nurse supervision, with a vacuum cleaner, and other things tends to be about $1,300 when you start, you know, full case rate. It's a lot. And so people will sit there and go, oh my God, it's too much. We can't possibly do it. And then they won't blink at paying $1,000. They won't blink at, and this is where the interesting thing is, there's really good evidence that the persistence of this effect, right? So the inner city asthma study published what is very similar to a community health worker model, $1,500, and they showed for two years that they showed a persistent benefit, right? Like, that's a great pill, right? Like, you would pay that pill every day of the week. And yet, when we say that it's somebody coming to your house and giving you uh, a HEPA vacuum, we, we, won't, we won't do it. And so I, I want to 
like push back a little bit about the cost because I think that that we hold different standards. So I'm going to get back on track, and I'm going to yeah. Anne is looking at me. So the uh, the barriers to asthma control. What are some of the barriers that you guys and uh, see in your practices? Yeah, so, so literally just not being able to access medicines, absolutely. What else? Well, they don't, I don't know if they've encountered a good teaching moment at the clinic when they are funds of that. Yeah, no, a lot of misinformation around, the, around what the medicines are for or, or other types of things. What else? Yeah. I think sometimes literacy Yeah, no, I think, I think people, health literacy is enormous in trying to think through ways in which to, uh, to address it. Uh, you guys got most of them. So cultural health practices. So sometimes people have very deep beliefs that other things are working. So for some of my Latino patients, menthol is like something you slather on everything, and it's really important. And so being able to, to understand that um, uh, and not viewing it as an either or, like I'm either going to use the inhaler or the menthol. Um, the skepticism, right, around, I'm not really sure my kid has asthma. Um, uh, uh, certainly barriers to accessing health care, um, really minimizing the risk of poorly controlled asthma, a lot of misinformation about asthma, um, you know, worries about sometimes inhaled corticosteroids and whether or not those will actually have long-term side effects, I think is really important. Um, a lot of social challenges, right? You know, you're worried about housing, you're worried where your ne next meal is coming. Taking that, that inhaler is just not as high on your worry budget in terms of thinking things. And then certainly language, both literacy and, and literally linguistic access. I think is really important. I would just like to share a little anecdotal story about some cultural health practices, pra practices and skepticism. We recently had a, a Haitian family who Kathleen, our, our Haitian Creole speaking community health worker visited and she had done the second visit and she was finishing up and the mom said to her, well, you know, I, I think it's fine that you want to come, but I don't really think he has mm -hmm. asthma. And anyway, we're going to Haiti, and he's going to drink the blood of some kind of lizard. Um, and their practice is that there's some particular lizard that is prevalent in Haiti that they take a teaspoon of blood and they have the child drink the blood, and their asthma is supposedly cured. Now, you can imagine that if that was something that was said to me, I would have, uh, my face would have said it all. And Kathleen said, well, okay, when are, you plan <clears throat> excuse me, when are you planning your trip, and could we schedule our third visit after you come back? And, you know, she didn't miss a beat. And, uh, you know, I think that's, the, that's one of the clear benefits of having a community health worker. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I think in a lot of ways it's... Um, uh, being able to kind of be more comprehensive about trying to address a lot of those barriers I think can be important. I'm going to start diving into some of the CHW models. Please uh, ask questions if there are things that are important. So the first one is our, the READY study, which I, as I introduced was reducing ethnic and asthma disparities of youth. Um, this is where we have clinical sites who will refer either poorly controlled or really severe asthmatics. We typically will um, uh, both identify them through clinic referral or through, um, we got a, a HIPAA waiver to be able to look at our ER list and our hospitalization list. So we can actually approach families directly or we can receive a referral from their clinician. Um, we typically do uh, between four and five educational visits with a community health worker. We began first where we did the asthma assessment at the first visit and the environment assessment at the second visit and then did three follow-up visits. We've now, um, uh, with kind of a second round of funding, collapsed that to do the asthma and home assessment at the first visit and then three follow-up visits. Um, and that we really try uh, as much as possible to make the asthma action plan the cornerstone of our asthma teaching. And so one of the things that we require of sites that refer to us or that we recruit from is that we have access to the medical records so we can get the asthma action plan. Um, and so that Anne is credentialed at both Boston Medical Center and uh, three of our community health centers in Boston so that she can go in and get the asthma action plan. Um, and then we really focus not only on asthma control, but that we also also focus on environmental control, that those two are not either or, but they're really viewed as both. Um, we do provide low-cost asthma supplies, so we do include a HEPA-filtered vacuum cleaner. We do mattress and pillow encasements for dust mite control. We do uh, a set of natural cleaning supplies, so these are things like um, baking soda or vinegar that we actually give the patients with green kind of make-your-own-at-home cleaning um, uh, recipes. Uh, and then we do a kind of a pest control kit, a garbage can with a top on it, um, some uh, copper wire gauze you can stuff into 
poles, sticky traps or other things, and uh, really large uh, Ziploc bags to help people with storage so that they can store things in their home without it becoming a harborage for, for pests. Um, uh, we also offer a lot of assistance and referrals, things like um, housing code inspections, uh, tobacco control, things like that. Um, and then our uh, nurse asthma educator, Anne, is the supervisor for the, the program. Um, we do a lot of key measures that you would think of, urgent care use, number of exacerbations. We do do an asthma control measure based on two-week recall of symptom days, rescue medication use, nighttime wakening or activity limitations. Um, we have a pediatric asthma caregiver quality of life score that was developed by Dr. Elizabeth Juniper. Um, we also look at environmental control measures. The community health worker does a walkthrough at the beginning and at the end of the study to show what we've, we've made uh, reductions in the asthma trigger score. Um, and that, that score is six different um, asthma things. So um, pets, uh, pests, tobacco, dust, mold, and, um, uh, and uh, I believe clutter. And then we also do a competing priority scale, trying to get at whether or not people are able to change some of their priorities around kids' asthma. So some of our preliminary data is, is really good. And as I said, we adapted our model from the um, uh, Seattle King County model, where we were able to show very similar results to what they were, huge reductions in symptom days from four days out of 14 to two out of 14. Um, asthma control level improved uh, across the board. So not everyone got to the well controlled, but we moved a lot of people from very poorly controlled to not well controlled. ER visits, hospitalization, urgent care use, kind of were able to show a lot of different reductions. Um, one of the nice things is this idea that I think there's a lot more than just the, the symptom days. I think that the caregiver quality of life becomes really important. And so our pre-score was actually pretty low. This is a, a, if people aren't familiar, it's a scale of one to seven. Um, and so uh, when they did this caregiver quality of life score in Seattle, most people were a five and then they moved them to like a 5.6. We are actually started in a 4.3 and we were able to move them up to a, a Five point, like a point difference is actually quite significant. Um, and this is things like, you know, feeling helpless, family needing to change plans, feeling frustrated, sleepless because of kids' asthma. Um, another model that was developed uh, by uh, Elizabeth McQuaid in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, was this HARP, Home Asthma Response Program. And this is a collaboration between St. Joseph Hospital and Community Hasbro Asthma Programs at Hasbro Children's Hospital. And uh, they've had a variety of different funding. We've had funding at the, for the Ready study, both from NIH and uh, HUD, actually, has been a funder of ours um, with the Mass Department of Public Health. They got some Rhode Island Department of, of Public Health funding. And then also, uh, recently, our, um, we're both part of a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Award, a CMMI award, um, uh, as part of the New England Asthma Innovations Collaborative. So HARP also focuses on young children, um, kids down to age two, um, after an ER visit with asthma, and um, they also follow home visits. And I think what's interesting is they do a three-visit program where visit one does include the RN um, asthma certified educator, and then the subsequent visits are with the community health workers. They also provide supplies, um, the HEPA filter vacuum, the bed coverings, the asthma friendly stuff. And I should say that we don't actually necessarily um, do allergy testing. We don't t ask people, are you dust mite allergic, and then only give those. We do it universally, um, uh, which is consistent with how it was uh, first implemented uh, in Seattle. Um, and they have also really nice outcomes. So what's interesting is a lot of the people they initially met did not have asthma action plans, right? 77% of the people coming through the ER. And so they were able to show that by the end, over 80% had an asthma action plan, reductions in daytime, nighttime ac activity. And they've been actually starting to do a return on investment analysis. So what they've shown is, is that for every dollar spent on the intervention, they actually will save over $2 in the the healthcare system. Um, Children's Hospital in Boston did a similar one where for every dollar spent, they saved a dollar forty to the healthcare system. So that more and more, this is not only showing that it's effective in terms of better health, but it actually may save money as well. Um, 
I wanted to just highlight our Boston Public Health Commission has been a real leader in the community health worker movement. Um, and they began a Boston Asthma Home Visiting Collaborative. We're blessed to have a bunch of different um, home visiting programs. So Boston Medical Center, Boston Children's Hospital, um, uh, other community agencies that are doing it. And so what they really wanted to do was kind of create a, a place for collaboration where the home visitors could come together, talk about different um, uh, common barriers. They wanted to be able to standardize some of the education educational messaging and be able to think about it. And they wanted to, to think through, in the city of Boston, we have a lot of different um, capacity issues. So Haitian Creole and Spanish are two of our languages, but we also need to think about Chinese and Cape Verdean Creole and Portuguese and uh, Hebrew or Russian or Chinese and all these different things. And so they've been really thoughtful about getting new funding sites so that they could have increased capacity across the city. Um, and then kind of when we think about complementary home-based services, it's not just the asthma home visiting, being able to do the trainings, be able to have them available or other things, but we also started the Boston Breathe Easy at Home program, which is a collaboration between healthcare sites like Boston Medical Center, the Boston Public Health Commission, and then the Inspectional Services Department, so the code enforcement agency in Boston. And so what we created was a web-based referral system for either if the community health worker goes to the house or if I, as a physician, am talking to a family and they disclose to me that they have, say, pests or mold in their house, I can refer directly to code enforcement and then get email updates about how the case is going. And so being able to think about the complementary home services to make the home visitors more, um, more effective has been really helpful. Yeah, Gail. So what happens with uh, people who are undocumented? There's a lot of fear among the undocumented community about any type of enforcement, right? And so um, I think there, there are two things. One is we've done extensive trainings with the, um, particularly the inspectors, around that the Breathe Easy at Home program is not families calling to report, it's their healthcare provider calling and saying that this is something that makes them sick. And so that really, um, uh, if there is, uh, they actually include a flyer around retaliation and the fact that if there is retaliation for a family, that they actually um, are able to, <coughs> to access the legal service um, system or others. The other thing is part of the Breathe Easy at Home, we have a flyer developed by our medical legal partnership. So that medical, how many people have heard of medical legal partnerships? All right, so not that many. So medical legal partnership is a, a really a healthcare model where you integrate legal services as part of your healthcare team. So bringing particularly a legal aid attorney, someone who understands the law, particularly things like housing law or benefits or, or education law into the healthcare setting and being able to, when you detect that someone has a legal need, right, you're trained to be able to start to detect that, that you then will have easy kind of one-stop shopping access. And so our medical legal partnership actually worked on, and it's actually available on the City of Boston's website. If you Google like City of Boston Breathe Easy at Home, you'll come up to our, our website page they have, we have a flyer actually developed for this very question in terms of healthcare providers feeling confident that if they're referring someone that the, um, uh, that there really is, um, uh, there's always, I can't say there's never a risk of associated with it, but that there really have been um, uh, no reported cases of someone being reported by their landlord to say the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, ICE, and so that just trying to, to help families think through how to access what their legal rights are without fear of retaliation. Um, uh, so these are the lists of the Boston oh, Asthma Home Visiting Collaborative. So the Public Health Commission is the lead, Boston Children's, Boston Medical Center. The Environmental Protection Agency has actually been really, um, the, in Region 1, has been really supportive of this and provided some seed funding for this. Um, we have health plans, like Neighborhood Health Plan, that come around the table, um, Partners Asthma Center and Tufts. And Tufts was important because one of the real gaps was the Chinese speaking community and so we were able to actually train asthma community health workers and then Tufts was able to then bid on this bundled payment pilot project because they had that capacity built in to their clinic. Um, and so what they do is monthly meetings where it's really about um, 
uh, a support network, right? These are asthma home visitors that can come, receive some asthma education, be able to, to um, discuss difficult cases, be able to um, uh, learn some uh, problem solving, peer to peer support and other things. And it's really the goal around it is standardization of service where um, people may deliver the asthma education slightly differently, but the common set of messages have all been agreed upon. And so that when we think about that, I think it's um, a really nice role for a public health department to play in terms of, of how to sustain these programs and, and standardize and ensure a, a certain amount of quality. So this is the uh, uh, one picture of the groups of the community health workers. I love them. Um, the last one is uh, there are some models out there around um, having clinic-based community health workers. So the two or three models I've presented so far have been very much home-based. You go and you do everything in the home and then it supervises back. I forgot to mention that part of the READY study is, is that we actually put updates in the electronic medical record. So after every visit, um, uh, the community health workers, often during the visit or right after, will upload what the findings are onto an online system. So we actually do everything via an iPad that has um, 3G access, goes on into a web-based data collection system called REDCap, which is free, and you can literally put all the information and then reviews that case records and then is able to then put an update into the electronic record um, so that the physician will see, up oh, ready visit just happened, this is what's happening, how many symptom days is going on, um, what was uh, done in, in other things. And so what's interesting is that there are some models now, um, uh, Tyra Bryant-Stevens at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia had a home visiting program that she's recently brought more into the clinic as an asthma navigator program. We're piloting thinking about um, a similar program at Boston Medical Center based out of our pediatric pulmonary clinic. And the thought here is that you would have someone who would follow up with someone after the clinic, use the community health worker, but still have the ability to go into the house um, and be able to um, have that person supervised by an RNAC to do that. I didn't mention, and because we have an ER nurse in the audience, is another model is the Impact DC program, which is um, Stephen Teach out of Children's National, where when kids come into the emergency room, they're enrolled in the Impact DC program, and so that the community health worker actually is part of the ER department because the primary care network in DC is pretty um, frayed, and so that um, their ability to actually do, and they have really, really nice documented outcomes in terms of, of referrals and success. It's a great model in the sense of like, how do you fill the disparity gap, right? And so in some ways that is, I think, uh, Minnesota sounds like it's much more advanced on the health home model. Like that's not the ideal, right? Ideally you would get people to a health home. But I also think it's interesting to think about different platforms of care to think about it. We don't enroll everyone that we approach. So let's be honest about that in the sense of, and part of that's reaching people. So, so we will, um, pull the ER list or the hospitalization list. Oftentimes, especially if someone's been hospitalized, we don't approach them right away because they're pretty overwhelmed and we may approach them a week or two later um, after the, the asthma hospitalization. Um, we do have, um, I, and so once someone is reached and agrees to be scheduled, right, we do have then um, a no-show rate for home visiting too. Um, we've done protocols around um, uh, you have to confirm the night before or the morning of because it's incredibly hard for the community health workers to drive out to the house and then have no one be home. So we, we make a policy around if you're scheduling that you do have to confirm uh, before the community health worker goes out to the house I don't know if we've looked at the do not keep appointment rate at Boston Medical Center can be quite high. It can be 30 or 40 percent um, in some clinics and that um, I would probably think that we have a similar no show rate or like where you're not able to confirm the appointment. Um, but it is a good idea. One of the things that's interesting is um, for some of the the clinicians, I've heard this anecdotally, that they like the community health worker program because they feel like it sometimes is easier for the family to communicate what's going on in between appointments and it sometimes can actually replace the follow-up visit in the clinic. So for the family, like um, uh, the uh, the director of the pediatric pulmonary uh, department is Robin Cohen at Boston Medical Center, and she and I have talked about comparing kind of traditional clinical nurse case management 
versus a community health worker model that's community-based and patient-centered, where they get to decide if they want to do home-based follow-up or clinic-based follow-up. They decide if they want to assistance with medication delivery to their house. They want to um, decide whether or not they need other social supports. And trying to, as I think when we think about re-delivering care, we were talking last night about telemedicine. Could you even have a community health worker in the house kind of calling into the clinic and making it easier from, from that perspective. I think that what's interesting is the, um, anecdotally, I think the purely clinically based community health workers, I'm not sure as a, are as effective as the ones that have a home component. Um, and I think that is about relationship building and, and other things. The thing that I've heard anecdotally is that the patients who are part of the, the asthma um, home visiting program feel more tied to the clinic and actually keep their appointments at the clinic more um, so that they're more likely to say like, okay, I, I know I need this. I know what I'm going to do. I'm, I know what I'm coming in to ask about and other things and that, that they tend to be um, uh, more integrated into the health home, which is an interesting idea that they're getting home-based services and yet they feel more tied to the clinic itself. Yeah. The other thing, someone was addressing, you know, the idea of shame around the home conditions yeah, it, it is really interesting. Uh, I'll repeat it just for the people on the video that the, uh, there is some shame around kind of home visiting uh, and you will see conditions, but then there's also sometimes really nice success that happens fast. So, so chemicals in the home is actually an incredibly common trigger. About 90% of the patients we go into the home are using some noxious cleaning agent like bleach or, or ammonia or other things. And, and you can understand why they're trying to do it, but those are asthma triggers, right? Um, they may be using an air freshener because they want to make the home smell nicer. Um, and so that sometimes just really simple stuff like switching to a green cleaning agent and not using the air freshener, um, they'll see a really immediate difference. Um, we actually had an NPR reporter come to the house and that's literally what the mom said was, you know, I, I didn't believe the community health worker that it would work, but she told me that she had used it herself. And, um, and when I used it, it worked really well. And I immediately saw that my, I haven't been to the ER since, and I think it's because I'm now using this green cleaning agent, right? And so I sometimes think, sometimes in medical stuff, sometimes the medicine, they don't see that immediate response, right? It's part, partly why a controller is sometimes hard to remember every day. They may remember the albuterol because they see the rescue, but it's harder to see that other one. But the environmental stuff, sometimes they'll see a difference really Really quickly and that can be again this kind of building on success that I think is really important yeah <clears throat> might be a better question for Joan or Dr. Brooklyn, but anything any Minnesota or Metro models or any use of the community health worker and ally yeah I'm going to let Joan out. I do know that they do utilize community health workers as part of the health home at Hennepin Medical Center, but they're more generalists. They're not necessarily implementing like a, a rigorous asthma program, but I think that that's an opportunity, right? It's not like they're, they aren't part of the health home. It's, it's that we want to think through what's an evidence-based way to kind of implement them further. Yeah. You know, I think it's so interesting that um, uh, typically what we find is people are very interested in the evidence, the peer-reviewed evidence, and we have um, uh, evidence over a decade. Uh, uh, some of it comes out of Seattle King County from Dr. Jim Krieger um, on uh, a, a whole series of evaluations that he has conducted uh, with successful outcomes for CHW models. But we also want to know what's in our backyard. Where is it working? Uh, who else is doing this? So, you know, very appropriate question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, and so what I am hearing at the Alliance, and the Alliance is the go-to place for folks that are working on CHW strategies, um, is, uh, is, as Megan said, HCMC, through its healthcare home program, has a team of nurse-led CHWs. Um, and uh, part of their work involves uh, interface with um, uh, asthma patients, um, uh, with uh, uh, asthma educator um, Faith Dolman, uh, who I know uh, works closely with Dr. Gail Brontman. Uh, very um, a positive response there. Uh, we know that uh, the um, CHWs uh, who are working um, uh, through a collaborative agreement um, between a mutual assistance association in Rochester and Mayo Health Clinic have been working on asthma, again, through, uh, through Healthcare Home and their work with the pediatric department. 
And then Welshare Inter International, which is a community-based organization that has uh, had, for the last 10 years, out of its 30-plus year history, a domestic program uh, largely focused on the Somali population, has done some more uh, what we might call more public health oriented asthma uh, education with the Somali community. So we have some examples here and there, but what we don't have is really um, uh, a model that um, folks can get around and begin to roll out uh, to be able to begin to get better results that we're seeing, uh, for example, in Boston and other places. What I might add is that this isn't sort of a, um, an outlier or an unusual model for asthma that really all across the country we're seeing uh, these models in, in, uh, in many cities and in um, uh, lower income communities, underserved communities where there's uh, uncontrolled asthma uh, uh, among kids. So what, what, what are some other examples? Well, I just came back from the American Public Health Association meeting in New Orleans, heard about a fabulous program in New York City at the um, New, New York Presbyterian Hospital, where for the last, um, I think almost 10 years, they've had a program called Win for Asthma that utilizes <coughs> CHWs in, in a, in, and I think what you're hearing is that the role is flexible and can be adapted to meet the particular community and institutional needs. So in that program, CHWs, when a patient, uh, a, a child is, is admitted for inpatient care related to asthma, a CHW makes a visit in the hospital before that patient and family return home to make that connection. And then there are home visits that follow. Again, uh, a supervised model. CHWs are not out there um, hanging up their shingles or working independently. They are wrapped into teams that are clinically supervised. And they're bringing, as, as, as Ann said, their, their unique contributions. So um, Chicago, Sinai Health uh, has had a great model, great success. Um, so again, all across the country, we're seeing these these models develop and Jim to your question would like you know through this conversation begin to um, uh, uh, build a, a network of people who would like to uh, introduce uh, CHW models more broadly to address asthma disparities and uh, I guess it, it was announced I think yesterday that the Massachusetts VNA is now part of, of Hennepin Health that you could imagine almost having community health workers and visiting nurses working together for a kind of a package of services, particularly if you integrate, no? It's, uh, the, Did I say it wrong? MVNA. MVNA, sorry, excuse yes. me. So trying to think about what are, what are different ways. I think that, um, Minnesota. Minnesota, thank you, excuse me. So trying to think about the, um, <laughs> thank you. Um, thinking about uh, what are ways in which uh, you could align existing resources and supplement, right, existing resources. I do think that, um, whether or not it's clinically based nurses or whether it's uh, public health nurses or whether it's um, uh, ER nurses or other things. I think that I, I think you could have respiratory therapists as supervisors. I think you could have a lot of different um, visions of, of how you would implement them. I do think it'll be interesting um, uh, moving forward as you think about um, almost the idea of managing a population. So say at Boston Medical Center, we have about 10,000, 10 to 12,000 kids in our primary care practice, right? About 10% of them have asthma. So you imagine 1,000 kids with asthma, and then you start doing risk tiers, right? Where you say, okay, you're low risk. Because I will say not everyone should have an asthma home visit, right? Like it shouldn't be for anyone with a diagnosis of asthma. We're really talking about how do you identify those high risk kids? Is it just that they've been in the ER or the hospital? And, and that's one way to identify them. Or is it, are there other ways we could think about it? They haven't refilled their medicine or they're really symptomatic or, or they clearly don't understand things well and, and we're not really able to um, uh, control their asthma. They're coming in for multiple steroid bursts. There are a lot of different ways you could think about identifying that high-risk pool. And then you make available to them kind of that. And I think we're getting more and more to what are the FTE ratios, right? What are the full-time equivalencies of, okay, so you've got a 
1,000 kids with asthma, we think you know 150 of them are going to be high risk. So that would be we need two community health workers to be able to do a, a six-month intervention with them, and you kind of roll your case list. And I think we will get closer and closer to what's the supervision, because Anne right now on 16 hours supervises two full-time community health workers. So it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's a piece of Anne's time with a um, being able to, to supervise them and, and move it forward. Yeah. I'm wondering if you've talked more about uh, any of the school nurse models. Yeah. No, I think that's great. So no, I have not talked about school-based models, so I want thank you for that prompt. And yes, I do think that um, where you base the community health worker does not have to be just health-based, right? It definitely could be school-based. It could be public health department-based. There are a lot of different ways in which you could think about about it. Um, uh, in Boston, it's interesting, when they designed uh, their prevention wellness trust application, they really zeroed down in actually schools and early education centers, actually, as where they wanted to focus their biggest energy because of the huge disparities in the zero to four population. We're talking about fourfold rates among black kids, zero to four, going to the ER for asthma than white kids, right? And so really trying. And so what they've really done is a lot of um, uh, that, that trifold linkage, right? Home, school, clinic, and being able to make sure that you have the asthma action plan, you've got the medicines on site, you're doing the education, that the teachers get educations around understanding the symptoms and being able to make sure the parents are there. And so I think absolutely school-based models, and there are a lot of great evidence-based stuff. I also think it's really interesting that the rates of of school absenteeism among kids with asthma it will make your hair curl. I mean, it's really like, it's it's unbelievable. And so what I sometimes will talk about is like, you can have the best educational reforms you want. If kids aren't showing up, or if they're not staying long enough in the school, they're churning from one school to another um, because their families are, say, um, not able to work because the kid has asthma, and so they end up being evicted, and then they move. Like, think about that. Like. The, in some urban school districts, 50% of the kids are absent more than 10% of the year. And in some urban schools, the churn rate can be a third of kids, right? There was one school in Tacoma, Washington, where they turned a classroom of, of 20 kids over with 56 different kids churning through that school, right? It's 179% churn rate. And, and so that a lot of it can be really simple things like just making sure kids are in good asthma control. And so I think of, you know, I am I'm a pediatrician, I'm focusing a lot on the health outcomes, but the educational outcomes may be another way to sell the idea of why a, an asthma community health worker. And I like the idea of kind of connecting the school and the home and the clinic together. And again, I think a community health worker is a really good workforce to help supplement uh, the school nurse programs. We're going to pick up where Megan left off, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the training that we do in Boston and the supervision. And then Megan's going to briefly talk about how you can integrate this program into your, your setting. Um, in Massachusetts, we have a specific asthma training session for community health workers. I work to develop that, and I am part of the implementation of that. It's funded through the Department of Public Health, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and implemented by the Boston Public Health Commission. And it, it, it serves as a building block for the, um, the comprehensive education that community health workers get that I spoke of a little bit earlier. They go through that first, and then asthma builds on that training. Um, it's a four-day home visiting training. It covers not only the nuts and bolts of asthma, which I will describe in a minute, but there is a, like a day and a half that's specifically devoted to environmental triggers, um, how to um, do some integrated pest management control, um, and there's a session that's almost a full day on motivational interviewing where these are role play, you know, very, very interactive sessions. Um, and as I said earlier, one of the things that I found really helpful, even though I had worked to develop the curriculum, was to participate in it. Um, I was able to see how it worked and to, to sort of gauge how the, the community health workers benefited or didn't benefit from the program. And we've tweaked the training based on needs assessments from the community health worker. Um, so we, we've really tweaked it a, a fair amount. Um, 
We also um, have a two-day refresher course that's offered annually. Um, and in between, based again on the needs that are um, described by the community health workers, we have added little trainings. I recently did a, a medication, sort of we called it an advanced medication training, and it came from a previous continuing ed training on medications that I really challenged the community health workers not to say, oh, he's on Flovent, but be able to recognize that you know, there's a difference. There's a difference in color. That's all very important. But when you're talking about Flovent, you're actually reading the label, and you're saying, "Hmm, this is Flovent 44, or this is Flovent, you know, 110." So that you're you're not just relying on the same um, things that patients are relying on. So they found that very very helpful. Um, we also do. There's a, a group that meets that does community. Uh, excuse me, quarterly um, support groups. They also are involved in support phone conversations and they share their experiences. We've had some issues around safety. Um, one of our community health workers was actually locked in the, in the apartment and someone was standing in front of the door saying you're not leaving. And that prompted us to look at the issue of safety. So we do a lot around safety. Um, and at these quarterly meetings, they can share those experiences because hopefully that will be a one-of-a-kind experience. Um, we haven't had any problems since, but at least they have a sense of you know ways that they can keep themselves as safe as possible. Um, under the uh, under development is a mentorship program. So we talked a lot about how do you know whether or not the community health worker is doing what you want them to do, and what are the standards and the scope of their practice. So by providing mentorship, um, hopefully that will ease people's minds. Um, and as Megan said, observation skilled uh, skills assessment. And if you look in your packet, I, I included in your packet a page that looks like this. It's a grid. We do four, depending on which study, uh, four to five visits. And when I do an observation visit, these are the key points that I keep in mind. And they're visit by visit. And you know, you can take a minute to just briefly look over them. But it's, you know, it's important from the, the most simple things, like making sure that the community health worker is wearing their badge. You know, I would never let someone into my home unless I knew exactly who they were and they had their credential with them. Um, to, you know, how do I assess whether or not they did the asthma training um, appropriately? So I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but that's one of the tools that we use as um, for supervision. Um, the the getting back to the training, if you look, there's um there's a checklist. Um, and this, this is just there to show you what we do at each visit. And in order for our community health workers to complete the visits according to protocol, what they learn in their training is very extensive relating to asthma. Um, we go over basic anatomy and physiology. They do the ACT test. They, they understand um, the control issues that I heard last night, the, the rule of two. Um, two nighttime awakenings with asthma per month, two symptom days per week, or two inhaler uses a year. Um, so simple ways that they can ask simple questions and get really important data. Um, we do go over medication and delivery systems. Again, this is hands-on. They, they practice, they, you know, I do demonstrations. Um, we go over asthma action plans. And there, you know, sometimes I hear there's, well, why do they need an asthma action plan? How effective is that really? And, you know, I think with anything, it's a, it's a recipe. It's, a, it's kind of a recipe. It's a go-to place where knowing that is on the refrigerator, as Megan said. When a child is symptomatic or getting sicker, the family doesn't know, what did she tell me to do? I don't remember all my, you know, they have a go-to. And I think that's really helpful. We've found that it's, it's been very helpful and the families have really liked it and have started to, you know, as the visits progress, they actually start to refer to it. Um, at first it's like, oh, I don't need one because I know what asthma is all about. Um, and so, you, you know, it takes a little bit of reinforcement. Um, we have the community health workers talk about flu shots and simple wellness um, things, keeping their, vi their well healthy visit appointments, um, communicating things with their doctors, and feeling 
you know, okay, not feeling shamed, understanding that wellness is important and well visits keep you well. You don't only go and access health care when you're sick. Um, and the benefits of that. Um, good communication. They learn how to contact me if there's an issue. We go over documentation, um, how to be very succinct in what they write. Um, Megan talked about the online uh, program REDCap, which is where they collect data. For me, on that checklist, you'll see lots of blank lines. That's where they will give me little bullets of things that are of concern to them. Um, so communication is also key in terms of understanding and feeling confident about what they're doing in the field. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, sort of reconciling what our expectation is of a visit and what the family's expectation is. Um, what do the families expect of their child? And Megan's done, done a lot of research on this. You know, if you have a parent who thinks that having a cough all the time is just the way my kid is. You know, you need to somehow reconcile that. So there's a, a lot of, you know, role playing again and instruction on how do, how do you best do that. Well, we talk about what's available, the resources that are available, such as, you know, Megan already spoke about, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But many times people don't, don't understand what's available. I told a brief story to Sylvia just a minute ago about I presented at a conference in Portland, Oregon, and my, I was asked to speak about medication and how people can get their medications funded. And of course, from Massachusetts, I said, well, that's not really a problem because meds are covered um, under our, our health care. And so I did all this you know, abundant research, and I presented this little uh, program. And people in the audience from Portland were so grateful because they had no idea some of these things were available. So, you know, we live in this, you know, world of perpetual motion, and sometimes we don't stop to see what's right in front of us. Um, so helping families to see really what's available and understanding how to access that and utilize it without fear of um, repercussion. A lot of motivational interviewing, so much so that the, the supervisors have been encouraged not only to attend motivational interviewing um, trainings, but also to utilize motivational interviewing with their community health workers. Does everybody have a sense of what motivational interviewing is? Raise your hand if you've heard of motivational interviewing. Okay, so it's the idea that you know you're not going in there and saying, "I think you should do this," "I think you should do that." It's it's more, you know, how are things going? And you know, can you tell me about your child's asthma? And then if the family says, you know, he's waking me up four nights out of the week, that sounds tough. It, you know, he's really, you know, doesn't sound like he's having good nights. And you know, reflecting back what they say, and then initiating a conversation whereby you say, what, what are some things you think that maybe we could do to, to help resolve this situation? So you're pulling them into the conversation as part of the solution and not going there. You know, I've been a nurse since 1976, and the old model for me was go in and you're the patient, I'm the nurse, I know what you need, here's the list, do it, and you'll get better. And that's how we all operated. And I, you know, I think part of that is the wisdom of aging, but also recognizing that that does not work. Um, doesn't work whether you're doing it with your kids or whether you're doing it with your patients. Um, you know, people have to feel part of in order to, um, to embrace what you're trying to, to share with them. So motivational interviewing is huge. Um, as far as community health workers being prepared for, for emergencies in the home, I will give you a little scenario, and I think we're probably a little bit ahead of time. But you know what, look at just the... Um, the case study with David. Um, David was a young boy, I think he was 12 or 13, and he was on school vacation this past February, and our Haitian community health worker went to visit David and his family, and David was Haitian, and David was really sick. I happened to be on an observation visit that particular day, and it was clear to me when we walked in that he needed a couple puffs of his inhaler. So we encouraged him to just take, he wasn't feeling well, we established that. We encouraged him to take some um, albuterol. And without giving the story away, uh, you know, his, his mom was very upset with David. And Kathleen asked him several questions, which are part of the, um, uh, part of the protocol. And we uncovered that David had been telling his mother 
that he had been taking his medication when in fact he hadn't. So uh, this little scenario is something that we use for the training for the community health workers. And I'll pose that question to you. You come into a, a home, the child is really sick, you certainly want to treat the child. Um, mom is really upset because David you know, told us lie about the, the um, medication and how he had been taking it when he really hadn't been. Mom lays into David and, uh, you know, is very, very upset with him, shaming him, just making him really kind of hang his head low. Um, as the community health worker, what do you suppose the most important issue there was there to, to address? The relationship? Anybody else? Do we all agree it was the relationship? I think what, what happened was his older sister was there and his mom was there and they just literally, I've never seen anybody like yell at somebody in front of you know, people from outside. I mean, they were very upset. And I learned from Kathleen that in the Haitian culture, lying is like, you don't lie. You do not lie, that is wrong. And so Kathleen needed to finesse the situation and explain to mom that, you know, could she see that David was struggling to breathe? And that, you know, try to turn her from, yes, I understand that. However, David is really sick. And, you know, perhaps he, well, the ultimate um, excuse was that he lost his medication and that's why he hadn't taken it. And so mom got angry that, well, why didn't you tell me? But when he tried to speak to mom, mom was very authoritarian and, you know, just um, not interested in, in talking with him. So Kathleen tried to make her see that, that, that's important. Your child shouldn't lie to you. However, do you recognize that he's sick? His sister was there and his mom was there and neither one of them really recognized how sick he actually was. So long story short, we worked through that and spent a great deal of the visit talking about recognizing symptoms. You know, he was dragging, he was having shortness of breath, you could hear him wheeze. Um, and, Sometimes parents have to be in partnership, especially with older kids, because parents tend to take the responsibility when the, the child is young, but when they get older, it's like it's their responsibility. And I think guidance, sometimes when you're not feeling sick, you don't always do what's right. Um, so Kathleen spent a lot of time with mom, a lot of time with the older sister, and a lot of time with David, helping him to understand that by being proactive and honest with his mom, Number one, he was going to feel better because he'd get his medication sooner. And it would help him in that he was approaching his mom, and so then he would have the support of his mother as well. Um, and so during that visit, we did a couple of things. He didn't have his um, controller medication. He had a nebulizer that didn't work, and he had albuterol. Um, so it was a Friday afternoon and we actually set him up with an appointment for the company to come and replace the nebulizer. We call the clinic, um, and in this case I called the clinic, but had I not been at the visit, Kathleen would have called me and I would have transmitted that information to the, the clinic. Um, what I usually do is call the triage nurse, and then the triage nurse takes care of whatever is, is necessary. So, you know, I think in terms of assessment skills, certainly they don't have the level of assessment um, that a, a licensed registered nurse would with, uh, you know, advanced degrees, et cetera. But um, I think part of the training is recognizing that, and if you can transfer that training into the home, you know, you can tell when somebody's not breathing well. Um, what's important is to know how to, what to do with that information. And that, going back to the asthma action plan, that's a good tool for the asthma action plan to be utilized when somebody, I'm not sure what to do, but I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna do it. So the community health worker knows what they can do within the, the home and knows when to, to access support on the outside. Um, in terms of the supervisor training, it's a two-day training. Um, again, we encourage people to go through the community health worker training so that they understand what their community health workers are doing. Um, they, we look at the scope of practice and talk to community health workers about how you, know, you don't alter anything on an asthma action plan. You don't make recommendations about um, changing medications or anything like that. Um, the, uh, as I said, the supervisors go through mo motivational interviewing and are encouraged to use it with their community health workers so that it's kind of a, a, a role, role model, role play. Um, um, they go through 
asthma basics. You know, we've talked a lot about the differing types of supervision, and it's important that whoever is supervising a community health worker understands asthma so that they can pick up on those key messages when something isn't going well. Um, Supervisors are also, especially in a clinic-based setting, it's important for community health workers who have an assigned role, and in your packet there's a job description, that the supervisors not only help to integrate them into the, the healthcare team, but also to prevent them from being the go-to person. Would you do this for me? Would you do that for me? They have a defined role, and they need to stay within that role. Um, they also go out, like I said, for um, observation visits for quality assurance. Um, and we have supervisory support calls, um, sharing ideas. Sometimes we even share patients because someone may not fit our model, so we'll refer a patient off. Um, I already did that. Megan's going to talk a little bit about how you integrate them into various settings. Yeah, I, I sometimes will talk about the, the keys to success for uh, community health workers is is the C and then the S and the I, right? So the C is certification. So making sure that, that community health workers have been trained, being able to um, make sure that they meet certain competencies and, and other things. The S is supervision, right? These are community health workers don't practice solo, that they are well supervised, that the supervision goes through training, right? That they are able to, to think about, you know, um, how what their role is within a team. So that really community health workers don't practice solo, that they are they are members of a team. And then the last one is this idea of integration. And I think that that more and more there are a lot of different ways. Behavioral health integration is something that people are talking about. How do you integrate into primary care or into home-based services? And so that in many ways, I think there are a lot of different ways that community health workers can be integrated. So one of them is, is in the medical home and the delivery of of care where they're a recognized kind of trusted member of the team. And this is where it's really important that even if the community health worker is predominantly doing home-based services, I still think they need to check in in the medical home. So for instance, we um, started at Boston Medical Center but expanded to one of the largest community health centers in Boston called East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. And so we actually brought over both community health workers to meet key clinical staff so that when clinical staff talk about, oh, I'm going to refer you to Benita, they've met Benita, they know who Benita is, they've met Kathleen, they know who Kathleen is. It's very clear to them who is which community health worker and that they're able to um, be able to feel confident that they're part of the, the East Boston team. Um, we are currently in the, the third year of the, uh, the grant from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid that funded that expansion and the Community Health Center is already talking about how are they going to continue this program after funding because they feel like they don't want to go back. They now have seen what it's like to be able to have this available as part of their resource. And they want to think about it as the person would become a neighborhood, the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center employee. They want to think about how they're going to, to be able to do that. Um, but a medical home is not the only place that they necessarily could be integrated. I think public health departments can employ community health workers. That's one of the models we have in Boston to fill some of the gaps around language access. Um, and I think that, that in many ways when you think about it, you may have five or six languages that you need, right? You'll need Somali, Hmong, you're going to need Spanish, you're going to need um, other ones, and so that it's going to be hard for you to employ enough people. And so you could think of where a public health department can become a base for a one-stop shopping contracts where you're able to say, okay, we're going to be able to pool resources so that we can have the linguistic and cultural capabilities and be able to do that. The other benefit of being integrated at a public health department is that you're integrated with other services. You're integrated with inspectional services and code enforcement that the Board of Health typically do. You may be integrated with public benefits and other programs. Um, we've had really nice um, partnerships around um, particularly younger kids that may have um, uh, healthy start nurses going into the home for after um, uh, babies are born and things like that and having the community health worker who's been specially trained with the environmental stuff and other things do joint visits together and being able to, to potentially even prevent some of the wheezing because you're able to prevent the triggers um, earlier in, say, a child's life. Um, the last piece of integration is that I feel like, especially as many medical homes are going to electronic 
um, health records is that it's really important to view this as part of care. Um, and so that one of the things that I think is really important is not just to have either a mailed copy of what happened or a faxed copy, but to actually put a note in the electronic record so that a, a clinician can see that this happened, what happened at the visit, so that they recognize that this service is going on. I think sometimes if it's um, partnering with a, a social service agency where you don't get that feedback loop, you can understand why someone wouldn't utilize the program because you don't know what's happening with it. Um, I do think that um, uh, I didn't put on this integration, integrating into the school environment. We think about where kids of school age spend the most time. They often spend the most time at school. And so thinking about ways in which to integrate, not only for the parent, so the parent knows what's going on, but then also integrating back to the, the clinical environment and making that a seamless transition. And there sometimes are some barriers around HIPAA about being able to to share information, but there, those are overcomable. Those are models that, that can be done, that can be really important. If the community health worker went in the home and first of all found that the child's technique with a disc assay wasn't good, they would contact me and say, you know, perhaps he's not feeling well because he's not getting his medicine. He does not know how to use this thing. Then I will call the triage nurse or I will you know, contact the physician and say, we had a home visit, this is what happened, and, you know, I'm leaving it in your hands to make a decision as to what you want to do. Let me know, and then we'll go back and reteach. You know, kids will be diagnosed with asthma, and they'll be sent home with an albuterol. When I scan the medical record, I see that the child's had three, sometimes four bursts of steroids in a year. And, you know, I kind of go like that. And then when the, the community health worker comes back with documentation, they, they really know, controller, controller, rescue, control, you know, they're taught to know that asthmatics should be on, on um, controllers. So they'll usually point that out to me. I'll also see it in the red cap data because there's a list of medications, how frequently they're, they're supposed to be taken and how frequently they actually are taken. Um, and so if there's a disconnect, I will usually check with the community health worker that it wasn't just an, uh, an error. I will oftentimes say, could you call mom and just clarify, like, are they taking this or are they not? Do they really not have a, a controller? So that I have my data in, you know, in a line, my ducks in a row. And, and then I'll call the physician and I'll say, okay, I had the, the community health worker double check with the family. This is what mom reports. I see in the medical record that you've ordered this and there was no sign, sign of that. So perhaps they were on it at one point, they ran out, they didn't refill it, and then I go back to the community health worker, can you call mom again and you know, ask her, or can you schedule that second visit a little earlier and check in and to really establish what, what is really happening. You know, sometimes we find people who, you know, they run out of flow vent and they have some med that, you know, the child was on two years ago and they'll pull that out of the drawer and start using it. And th so there's a lot, again, being the eyes in the home can tell you so much. And ultimately what they see, if there's a disconnect there, they report it to me. And, you know, I make the judgment as to whether or not, you know, I look in the medical record to see what, what the actual orders are and, and make sure that that's what's being followed in the home. I, I think that, I think what's key is the community health worker and really Anne don't make a clinical treatment decision. They bring it back to the treating physician and say, here's some information. Like in the last note, it said you went up for flow vent 220, but just so you know, the patient's reporting to us, they're still using 110. What do you want us to do? Do you want us to tell them to get the 220 and start using it? Or, or they seem to be doing pretty well on the 110. What do you want? Or the other piece that we uncover a lot is they'll have not just one asthma action plan. They have three asthma action plans. They have an asthma action plan they got from the ER. They have the asthma action plan they got from their specialist. And they have the asthma action plan they got from their primary care doctor. And they're not the they're same. All. They're all different. And so we'll go back to, frankly, the, you know, the, the doctor, and, and this is where it sometimes gets difficult, which doctor do we go to, right? So we tend to say the ER doctor gets actually the least, you know, because they weren't part of the continuity team. So then we'll, we'll go to the asthma specialist and the primary care and say, what, which one is the right one? Tell us what you want to, us to be teaching, right? So I think I, I really want to emphasize that, that it's, it's really information gathering, not clinical decision making. And it's really, and this is why I really emphasize the integration piece, is that the only way you know that is if somebody at Anne's level has access to the medical record and can look and see what 
their rep what's reported to be what's supposed to be going on. And then the eyes and ears of the community health worker report back what actually is going on. Um, there are definitely times when patients will actually do what you ask, which is bring in your medicines from home, right? There is, we, we almost put in a slide. So Robin gave us literally the most beautiful slide, which was like 20 inhalers, right? 20 different inhalers of, you know, five different flow vents, some Advair, some Albuterols, you know, Pro-Air and, you know, non-HFA and HFA. And like literally that's, you know, they have the baggie, right, you know, of, of stuff and nobody knows kind of what's new and what's not. And so the community health worker sometimes will be like, okay, this is expired. Or if it doesn't have a counter, it may still be puffing and have no medicine in it, right? So we got to get rid of that. And so just trying to, to again, not make decisions, but just be able to implement the plan that you made from the office in a much more effective way. When we first started this, there was a question as to whether or not the community health workers themselves would document in the record, and it was decided that that would not be the case. Um, and I'm actually happy about that because it, it gives me a, a higher level of review of what they're writing and understanding what's going on. Um, I do a couple of things. At Boston Medical Center, I free text about a visit, and I'm pretty precise. At the neighborhood health clinics, um, three of which we have patients enrolled from, I use a template. So it's pretty straightforward. I can free text into the template if I want to add something. Um, I'll also add there that, you know, patient was taking wrong medication. I checked, you know, with physician and, you know, this is the plan or whatever. Um, but it's basically the visit um, number, so if it's the visit one or visit four, it's the date, it's whether um, the child, they do the asthma control test at every visit, so that's included there. After I do that, is the child well controlled, not controlled, do, and then there's a drop down menu where I, um, if I say that the child is not well controlled, it will say, you know, what was the advice given? Was it, did you call the clinic, you know, while you were at the visit? Did you suggest um, two days of albuterol and have the family call the clinic to schedule a follow-up appointment? Did you call the emergency room? You know, there's just a, a whole drop-down menu. Um, there's a drop-down menu for environmental triggers for um, the products that we bring in, what was delivered, um, so that the, the nurse practitioner in the clinic will ask you know, the family, are you using the vacuum cleaner? How do you like the, the fact that um, you have natural cleaning products? Is that working for you? Um, so there's the, again, there's this incredible connection. Um, and as I said, there's always an opportunity to free text whenever I want, so. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I think, I can't emphasize enough the, the, um, that two-way communication and that someone of the appropriate licensing level is putting the information in. I think for me, um, uh, I think our community health workers are actually amazing, but I wouldn't want to put that burden on them. I think it's it's better for Anne to, in her supervision, will review what's written from the red cap. So right, so we're trying to make the the seamless communication real time. Um, uh, we're able to see what time the stuff is entered into red cap, right? We're able to to do that and then be able to then translate that into the electronic record. And then sometimes, you know, if there is a more urgent thing, like what what controller do you want them on? She can either flag the physician using the electronic record and then make the change, or she can, if it's more emergent, page the physician or um, uh, call the nurse for the clinic. All right, Janelle in the back and then, oh. Exactly. Um, on the family, the Haitian family, and to, to look at as for support groups for the family. Yeah, I think, so the, the question was really related around support systems for the family itself and not just thinking about the individual, but thinking about the family, whether it be support groups or connected to faith-based organizations or other things. And, and I would say absolutely. We've actually started to look a little bit into, could you do a case rate that's family-based instead of individually based? So you sometimes will have... Um, uh, parents and kids that have different forms of insurance, right? One will have one managed Medicaid managed care, another one will have a different one, uh, maybe there is even a third one, and that can make it more difficult. But if you did a line where you had, um, everyone had neighborhood health plan, you could imagine, because that would actually then potentially be able to spend more time in the home, be able to treat everyone's asthma, um, because we know that this can be familial, where oftentimes you have a parent with asthma and a child with asthma, and be able to um, do it. It is, it, it's tricky, because trying to think through um, uh, with that complexity, not everyone goes to the same health home, right? So you could imagine having to communicate with multiple health 
homes for it. But I, I totally agree with you. I think that that in many ways, when we think about um, this intervention, we shouldn't just think about it on the individual level. We should think about it on the family level. And the other thing that's really interesting is starting to think about community health workers in a more community level, right? So the idea that that there's a lot of evidence now about the interplay between individual health and community health. And so um, one of the things that our community health workers spend a lot of time on is frankly legal issues like housing code enforcement or other things. And they've been trained by legal aid attorneys and things like that. And there's more and more evidence around, this was work that was done in Cincinnati around the idea of um, you can spot kind of individual like landlords that aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and then you can track those landlords and then potentially force those landlords to make the buildings better, right? And then the flip side is, is that you can actually track communities and look at what's the density of code violations in that community. Can you actually see um, uh, a heat map around the concentrated areas where there's more code violations and then look at whether individuals are more likely to end up in the emergency room based on not your home, but the homes around you, right? And that's uh, Andy Beck is the, is the first author on those papers. One was published in pediatrics, one was published in health affairs. And so I think you're right. I think that um, uh, what we're describing in some ways is a very um, simplistic unilateral view of how a community health worker could be viewed, where it's a, we're describing an intense model. Again, not every asthmatic is going to need it, but I think it starts to speak more towards um, thinking on the more population level and community health workers. There have been examples where community health workers are doing more community health, particularly out of community health centers, using that platform as a way to not only promote for the individual patient they're seeing, but for an entire community as well. Janelle, you haven't? Yes. Yeah. So, um, I was just wondering about the medication technique. If yeah. If you ask the, um, the family to show me how you use that medication. One of the nice things is Neighborhood Health Plan in Massachusetts did 10 different languages of visual pictorials of how to use asthma medication. These are wonderful and they're available on the web. You don't um, need to be from Massachusetts or anything like that. And so I really encourage people, they're very, um, they're really helpful in terms of trying to do uh, techniques. But I do think that it's, um, uh, again, the community health worker would only do a small piece of that. That would be something that a, a more medical professional would follow up with and or bring them back to the clinic to be able to do it more intensively. Um, I'm going to keep going because I want to make sure we have time for our breakout. So one of the frequently asked questions we get a lot is, do, will community health workers um, replace public health nurses? And the answer to that is no. Like you couldn't replace a public health nurse. I think that in a lot of ways, I tend to think of them as public health nurse extenders. This is where, and the, I described the HARP model, the home asthma um, response, where they have the health nurse and the community health worker do the first visit together and then have the community health worker do the follow-up visits. And so I think that um, uh, I definitely want to make sure that no one walks away today with the impression that we think community health workers can replace public health nurses. Um, how do, can I trust what, what community health workers do in the field? So I think supervision in the field is important, not for every single visit, but for sporadic quality insurance purposes. And so going out even 5 and 10 percent of the time just to see how things are going works for both levels, works for not only helping the community health worker with their competencies, but feels that it's important. We can tell um, real time from when somebody uploads the data. So we know what time the visit happened because they uploaded data from that. But then there have been times when there have been questions about what a community health worker is doing. And that's where we can really utilize the same things that anyone would around home visiting and other things. Um, we talked about handling emergencies. I think safety is a big thing. We actually modified our protocols around the first visit now is done in pairs, where a community health worker doesn't go out by themselves. Two community health workers or a community health worker and an observer go out because then the family um, can be assessed for how safe it is for the community health worker to be there by themselves. And I really have emphasized to my community health workers, at any point, if they don't feel safe, they should leave. And they, we have code phrases that they have been taught around how do they leave a situation that they don't feel safe in. And I think that that's used in any home visiting, right? Like whether you're a public health nurse or um, other things, those are, those are important things. And we really emphasize those. And then clinical emergencies, what's the way, when, what, how do you call 911? How do you get someone into a clinic or other things and being able to reinforce that. And we do have Anne as a backup. Anytime they're in the home, if they have a question, they can reach her by cell. Um, 
So I want to kind of go over a, a breakout session that we um, tried to think about. And so in your packets, you've got a kind of uh, who, what, where, when, why, and how kind of sheet. And so what we're hoping is that over the next 15 minutes or so, people will take some time to kind of start to think about who would be a, a patient population that you would want to target if you were thinking about, about adding a community health worker to your healthcare uh, asthma care team. What would be the type of intervention you would envision a community health worker doing, right? Um, when and where would they deliver the service um, uh, and or the intervention? Um, why would you do it? What goal would you set? What, what's your goal in doing it? And then start thinking about how you could move forward with it. Um, when we convene back and people can share some of their, their different things, and Ann and I will be walking around to see if we can help you, um, uh, Joan can talk about some of the, uh, the Alliance's funding for, for pilot grants to be able to use a toolkit to try and move this forward. So this is meant as an exercise to help you start those juices flowing um, to try and think about it. And so we'll um, do this for about 15 minutes and then wrap up. I just want to quickly give you the website for this because I don't think it's included in your... Sorry, I don't think it's included in your package. So the website, it's Neighborhood Health Plan, and it's www.nhp.org. And it's, you click on providers, and then a little box comes up on the right-hand side of the screen that says clinical resources, and I think it's the fourth or the fifth topic. It says asthma resources for education, and you click on that, and you'll have a choice of a number of different handouts that we, we pass out colored copies um, so that families can use them and that community health workers use them in their teaching. So, um, uh, so I, I just want to kind of walk through actually the, the who, what, where, when, why, how, and if people are willing to share some of the stuff that they were, they were thinking. Um, uh, I think the, the first is kind of who. Who would be patients that you may want to target with um, uh, adding a community uh, health worker as part of your asthma care team? Yeah. Well, in the school setting, obviously, the poorly controlled students. Yes. So that's, I mean, we're going to not look at ethnicities. We're going to look at how are you physically. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so you're going to look at uncontrolled asthma and, and whether or not that's hospitalizations or ER visits or whether or not it's just, you know, by symptom report, you want to be able to target the highest risk people. Absolutely. What else? Yeah. So, so age is a huge disparity. We talk a lot about disparities by racial and ethnic lines, but in asthma, age is actually huge. So we talked about in Boston, we've targeted the zero to four population because they are um, largely sometimes out of care in their home and they can have huge asthma disparities around it. So certainly age targeting is, is another way to think about it. The thing we've kind of danced around and um, I want to kind of just talk about it head on is the cost differential. So a community health worker doesn't cost as much as a public health nurse. And it's so I don't want to say, again, replacement, but when we think about time, a community health worker can spend more time with a family sometimes. And that, I think, is a, a huge thing. So that if you have someone that has cognitive barriers, so for instance, in some of our um, families, an asthma action plan, as it traditionally is laid out, doesn't work, right? So we literally have done low literacy asthma action plans with like a son and like a picture of the inhaler and the number two, right? And then literally like a moon and a picture of the inhaler and a two. And you'll literally kind of walk through kind of what and what a asthma action plan kind of green zone looks like with a family to be able to, to do that. And I think that that's something that our community health workers asked for and we were able to kind of help de um, develop with them. All right, so, so the who, you guys have a lot of good identifications of the who. So the what, what types of interventions would you want a community health worker to be helping with? Yeah. So being able to be your eyes in the home, walk through, be, be trained to identify environmental triggers that families may not be willing to report to you, but are pretty evident when you're walking through the, the house itself. Combination with a healthy home specialist. 
And I was just about to say, and, and this is this is where like an, an inspector could be doing the more rigorous assessment and the community health worker may be the one to help with the education component, right? Again, a culturally, linguistically appropriate follow-up education because a lot of the healthy housing stuff is structural, but a lot of it's behavioral, right? What do you do with your dishes? What do you do with your food preparation? And how do you, where do you store the food? Where do you store the garbage? Are there ways in which we can get rid of the clutter um, uh, or other things and so yeah being able to think of that educational follow-up is great what other ideas no asthma education so we get we can do it I will say I forgot Anne did bring an example we do our asthma education using a um, kind of a, a validated asthma education tool called you can control your asthma and that was developed by the asthma and allergy foundation of America we actually translated it to Haitian Creole because it um, uh, we felt like that was uh, a gap, and so it's available in English, Spanish, and Haitian Creole. It has a kid booklet and an adult booklet. Very low literacy, um, really nice, but I think that that can be important. It's underneath the, it's right there on the oh, shelf. sorry. So this this is what it looks like, and we can have it in the front for people who want to look at it. All right. So the when and where, when when and where would you want to be able to think about adding the community health worker? Yeah, so there, there definitely are really nice models. There's one developed in LA um, uh, with a, a mobile van going around to particularly increasing access. I do think that, oh, I, I was gonna say, so, so that's what I think is hard. I'm gonna argue that I think a home-based component is really effective. Like that's what the research kind of shows is that, but if you can get into the home, and that's a big if, so I wanna say, but I think that's where we think of community health workers as being potentially a specialized workforce, one that could get in the home better because of their kind of cultural background, their linguistic background. I think that sometimes being able to talk as from a, having a physician say, I think this is a good idea, would you, you know, I'm gonna have the program contact you, tell you more about it, has been something that we've found effective, that cold calling families doesn't always work as well as if we have a physician endorsement, um, and then thinking about that. So thinking about, again, the, the targeting of who you wanna reach out to, that high risk pool, they've already come to the ER and hospital, it was kind of a seminal event for the family, can we think about ways to follow up with them? Um, Ann made a good point, one way that we get into the home is the incentives, right? So at the first visit, Visit, you get the mattress covers at the second visit you get the pest kit with the home cleaning supplies at the third visit you get the vacuum cleaner it's not that we don't think the vacuum cleaner should be there at the first visit we just delay it so that it helps us get into the homes and so being able to think through ways to use incentives not only for your intervention but also to get into the home itself as Ann alluded to there's a the incentives match the intervention, right? So we're telling them about food storage and then we give them three Tupperware containers, large Tupperware containers that they can put like cereal or rice or other types of like dry goods that they wanna store um, or things like that. And then we do include, and partly we have this because it's a research study, we're able to get a grocery card as a final incentive to complete the program. One of the things that we've been struggling with is, is sustainability with Medicaid being able to get those as reimbursable, durable medical goods, right? So I probably just jumped Pam's question that she was thinking, but it is this idea of, and we, I think we will get there. It probably will be part of a bundled, um, or sorry, like a case rate where you'll be able to figure it out. We've been able to figure out how do we order these things from Boston Medical Center and figure out the storage of them, but it's, it is an interesting kind of sustainability because I think the services are important, but I think the goods are as important to supplement the service in the long run. And then lastly, why would you do it? Like what metrics would you do or, or what are ways in which we would um, think about what, what would you be tracking to change? Yeah. Does the Juniper quality of life scale um, have any kind of metrics for um, asthma self-efficacy management? Yeah, no, it's a good question. So the Juniper scale does not include a efficacy scale within it. Some of the studies, we, we decided our questionnaire was too long, so we did not do an efficacy scale. That being said, some other asthma community health worker studies have and have shown improvements in efficacy scores. In fact, I think the Yes We Can program, when they published it, did include an efficacy score as something they improved. I will say this, so we asked two questions around asthma action plan. We asked, do you have one? And about 60% of the time someone says yes to that at our baseline. And then we asked, do you use it, right? And so the do you use it 
it question, you drop off about 20 to 30 points, right? And so one of the things we are proud of is that by the end of our study, at least 80% of the people we say are using the asthma action plan as their game plan every day. What am I going to do today? Am I going to do the green zone because my kid looks pretty good? Am I going to do the yellow zone? My kid's starting to get sick. And then am I going to, my kid doesn't look good. I need to go to the, the hospital. And what's really great is like, we know we're successful when the community health worker comes back and says, you know what? They told me that the kid had a cold and they started wheezing more and they used the asthma action plan and they didn't have to go to the clinic and the kid's better now, right? So they used it the way it's supposed to be used. And so I do think that this is, it's hard in an office setting to have enough time to get someone to that point. And that's why, again, I think of the community health worker as an extension of me and my practice. I come up with the asthma action plan. I typically negotiate it with the family, but then I need someone to help them implement it.